Welcome to Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living. And also by this station and other public television stations. And now your host, science correspondent, Ira Flayton. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome again to Newton's Apple, the program that answers your questions about science, medicine, nature, the world around us. So let's get right to that first question. And today it comes from... Eric Redlinger. Eric, you had an interesting question. Why don't you tell everybody? How come I feel so bad when I get a sore throat? Yeah, you get a cold, a sore throat. It really feels bad, doesn't it? Uh -huh. yeah, it hurts me too. Well, that's why we're going to answer that question. And here to do it is Dr. Jan Ophoven. Chief Pathologist at Children's Hospital of St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Ophoven, how come a sore throat makes us feel miserable? If we didn't feel bad when we had an infection, it would mean that our immune system isn't working properly, and that could kill us. That's sort of like no pain, no gain going on in the immune system, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Let me show you. This is a schematic drawing of the immune system starting with the lymphatics that connects with the lymph glands that cluster in the axilla or the armpit and the groin, the neck, tonsils and adenoids, the spleen, thymus, bone marrow that manufactures important components of the immune system, and the circulatory system that contains the molecular components of our defense system. Mm -hmm. It certainly is an extensive system around the whole body, but I want to ask you to try to focus a little bit. Let's take an example. For example, if I get a sore throat, like I have one now, and what is the problem with what goes on there to make me feel so terrible, you know, the fever that follows it. Let me show you. All right. Oh, we're back to our big head again. Cross section of the human head, we are going to have a severe case of beta hemolytic strep tonsillitis. I beg your pardon? <laughs> also known as plain old strep throat. Okay. The strep will enter through the nose or the mouth, penetrate through the lining of the mouth cavity. About that point, you're starting to feel raspy, sore. If you look in there, right. your throat's red. Right. If it proceeds into a tonsillitis, we end up with a big, angry, sick tonsil. Mm -hmm. Here is a human tonsil. It looks a lot, you know, a lot bigger than I thought it would be. Well, it wouldn't be out if it wasn't <laughs> abnormal. All right. Let's take a look at it under higher magnification. You can see a close-up of a human tonsil. Ah, yes. And what you're seeing here is a grooving and notching on cross-section. It's very irregular pink color on a stained cross-section under the microscope. You can see it's got an organized appearance. It's very blue because that's the blue stain of the cells of the lymphoid system. Higher magnification shows you that the, si the cells are of various sizes and are very closely set together. Mm -hmm. Abnormal tonsil, where there's pus and reaction and inflammation, disorganizes that normal tonsillar structure. Mm -hmm. Well, what is going on inside the tonsil there that creates this, this hullabaloo that's going on? Join me in my tonsil. Join you in your tonsil. <laughs> okay. Welcome to my tonsil. Look at this. This is magnificent. And we're entering into a tonsil that is waging a battle of tonsillitis. And all around us are the cells of the inflammatory reaction. And in between these cells is fluid containing very important molecules. It's a complex system interacting together to fight this infection. Mm -hmm. Here is the culprit, the strep bacteria, represented by these um, organisms in a chain, which is what they look like underneath the microscope. Here is a polymorphonuclear leukocyte, or a poly, as we call it in the business. This cell is responsible for eating and killing the bacteria. This is one kind of a, of a white blood cell, right? That's right. After it has done its job and it's eaten many bacteria, the cell will die, and the dead cells become pus, which is represented by this green cell that, here. That's what pus is. Let me see, dead, dead white blood cells. So keep going. Plasma cells come into the reaction a little bit later, and they contain abundant amounts of antibody, which helps to kill the, uh, the bacteria. Mm -hmm. 
above you there is that dumbbell-shaped cell. That's a macrophage. These are the scavengers or the garbage truck cells, and they pick up the debris and dead cells, as represented by this fellow over here. <laughs> garbage bag. <stuck. laughs> he actually, this is how he looks underneath yeah. the microscope. They're just filled with um, cellular debris and and dead organisms. Well, it looks like there really is quite a battle going on in here. Is, is what does this have to do with us feeling terrible? Is this the battle causing all of this? What happens is this battle is waging. Is we have disrupted cells and parts of the bacteria themselves leak into the um, vascular system, get to the brain, and causes us to raise our thermostats to a higher level, thus a fever. So that's what causes the fever. Does the fever help us win the battle? Is there a good reason then why we have a fever? Absolutely. People who have healthy immune systems get the fever. People with certain kinds of immune deficiencies don't mobilize a fever, and they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. The fever, if you can imagine how bad it makes us feel, it makes the bacteria feel even worse. Now this is the this is what's going on in the immediate war zone. What about in the planning rooms? Are there any places that are making ready for the next battle that might occur? Let's take the material that this macrophage has eaten and it move and move it into the next phase of the immune system, which is the lymphoid system. This okay. is the blue part of that tonsil that we were looking at underneath the microscope. Mm -hmm. This is the T cells. They're very small and they're responsible for memory and recognition and enhancement of the immune response. T cells. The B cells are represented here by this large follicle. They're responsible for making antibodies. It's important for all components of this system to work effectively together in order to have a normal immune system. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that the T cells remember from one infection to the other. If they remember this, the, the previous case of strep throat, in, in our case, how come we keep getting more cases of strep throat? Aren't we ready for it the next time it comes around? Well, it may feel like it's the same, same strep throat because we get the same swollen glands and fever. However, it's a different strep. Just like there's different races of people, there's like different races of strep. Mm. And so the T cell system does recognize, but it only recognizes one kind at a time. That's like getting the common cold. The reason why you get the cold virus over and over again is because it's really different virus. It's not the same cold virus as you had last time, right? It's the same principle, although the immune response to a viral infection is very different from that to a bacteria, although the components mm. are the same. Well, let me just stop on, on the viruses one, for one minute because I want to talk about the AIDS virus. Now, the AIDS virus causes the whole immune system to break down, and I know there's the, the, T, the T cells are involved. What is going on here with the T cells and AIDS? With the AIDS infection, the T cell arm of the immune system is disarmed, so to speak, and so recognition of invading organisms does not proceed normally and therefore mm -hmm. they're very vulnerable to infections by normally non-dangerous organisms. Mm -hmm. What are some other instances where the uh, immune system is backfiring like this? Well, unfortunately a very common one is some kinds of arthritis where the mm -hmm. body recognizes joint tissue as foreign and mobilizes a severe destructive immune response against it. Mm -hmm. Another case where the immune system is working against us is when we want to transplant a foreign organ into right. someone. We have here a human kidney. If the immune system is able to mobilize such a raging response to a microscopic strep, strep organism, you can imagine what it would do with a half a pound of kidney. That's why it takes so much work to get the body to uh, recognize that and accept it, huh? That's right. That's why we look for compatible donors and why we have to take drugs to to help mute certain aspects of the immune system in order so that we don't have a major reaction. Fascinating. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Furcal. I never realized how complex the immune system was before. I think we all feel a little better now, and we'll be back in just a minute. per hour on the top of the course and again down here at the bottom. An exciting downhill race. It's a showcase for superb athletes and modern engineering technology. While athletes have been training to get the most out of their bodies, engineers have been designing skis to help skiers get the most speed and efficiency possible. Here to help us find the winning edge in skiing is John Howe, consulting engineer and author of the book Skiing Mechanics. Welcome to the program, John. Oh, yeah, right. I'm amazed at how these skiers are able to go down those mountains, you know, remain up on the skis and get down there in record time. What is happening? 
Ira, this world-class athlete is really a highly complex system. It's got a brain up here, which is factoring all the speeds and forces mm -hmm. and so forth. A uh, highly developed physique, body from years of training, lots of strength, and equipment, which has evolved over the years. And let's talk about skis, which I think is the most important part. And uh, you brought a whole bunch yeah, of interesting-looking skis here. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a quick here. history of uh, ski technology, starting uh, from a ski typical of uh, 2,000 years ago, or probably up to the turn of the century. Looks just but, like a piece of yeah, wood. It was a, it was a working ski, maybe a, a doctor or a post, postman might have it. and. Uh, but it's really kind of floppy and uh, <laughs> quits easily. Can't control easily. that very easily. No, automatic. no. In about the 30s, uh, people discovered the skiing was fun, and they kind of evolved into recreational uh, skis. But really, the, the big change came, the revolution came after World War II, when uh, Howard Head was uh, an aircraft engineer and was able to uh, put together aircraft aluminum developed during World War II with a, in a composite sandwich and properly put all the materials together to really make a predictable, hmm. uh, highly sophisticated structure. Forty yeah. years later, we've evolved into this structure, which uh, is a very modern ski, but it's still basically a sandwich ski where the, the structural skins are spaced apart by a core, hmm. and uh, everything is optimized, the damping. Uh, you notice it's very torsionally yes, stiff. It's very stiff. It has a, has a nice shape to it. The only similarity, it seems, between this new ski and the real old one here is that they're, they're both long that, and that's, straight. That's you know? about it, right. Well, yeah. let's, let's go talk about what the, the construction of yeah, the new type skis are. Yeah, what's going on inside, because I got the pieces and parts. So. Okay. These are the important materials which go into most skis today. I didn't realize you had so many different types of materials. You have metal, looks like wood, a little fiber here. Yeah, but each one has a very important function to serve. The most important thing is the stiffness of the ski. And we take uh, high tensile aluminum, mm -hmm. like head use, uh, way back after World War II, and or pre-cured sheet of fiberglass, mm -hmm. or both. Mm -hmm. And if you sandwich them apart, by a light or weight core, you can get the stiffness and strength of the ski. And that's, partial, that, and that's important when right. you ski. This makes the, the structural beam of the ski. Mm -hmm. and these, other pro these other materials are important. You need a polyethylene to slide on the snow surface. You need a, a steel edge to to give a sharp biting edge in the ice. Now, how important is the uh, is the structure versus the shape well, of the really, ski? Well, really, as a skier, you're, you're more concerned with the external parts of the ski, the shape and the, the bending stiffness of the ski and so forth. For instance, uh, this little sample has a very exaggerated side curvature to it. If you put this ski at an edge to a surface and press in the middle with the weight, with your weight, you reverse bend that ski into a turn. So it bends backwards, and what happens then? Right. Well, if I can show it better on the surface here, right. which kind of simulates snow. If, if it were flat, the ski would run, run straight. Mm -hmm. But when you bend it in a reverse curve by putting your weight in the middle, the ski wants to carve into a very long radius turn. So you just then have to put your weight on the edge and the ski will make its own little turn. That's right. And that's what helps you make those turns. Right. Well, this makes hmm. quite a long turn. It's very important to the racer because uh, he, the racer who makes nice carved turns is going to dissipate the least amount of energy. But it's just important to me, the amateur skier. Sure, too. because it's helping you turn. You may make tighter turns oh. by skidding a little in the back. Mm -hmm. So much for theory. To, to find out if this actually works in practice, we went out to a ski slope and applied these mechanical principles and this is what happened. Unfortunately, the last time I'd been on skis was 10 years ago. And at that time, I wasn't about to win any medals. I'm skiing, I'm skiing. My skis felt a lot more comfortable than they did years ago. But it was how easily they turned that was really exciting. Whoa, great okay. turn. <laughs> How come, how can a ski turn so well like that? Ira, it's all right in the ski. The side of the ski is a long arc. The curved side of the ski is actually part of a circle with a radius of 150 to 200 feet. You mean if you let the yeah. ski turn on its own, it would make an, an arc that big, huh? Yes, it would make a very long carving arc, providing you put it on an edge and put some weight against it. So what if you don't want to turn in such a long arc? You want to make a shorter arc. Normally, you want to make a much smaller radius, especially when you're learning. Mm -hmm. So then, you just put, a little, put your weight forward a little more, and the tail of the ski will slide a little more than the front. John showed me how, by angling both his knee and his hip, he can put his ski on edge. Then, the ski will naturally carve an arc the shape of its side cut. If he puts his weight forward, the ski will skid into an even tighter turn. He controls his direction by shifting his weight. Weight on his left ski, and he turns right. 
weight on his right ski, and he's off to the left. I'm going to try to make my wedge yeah. here. Get my skis to yeah, just, just hold yourself back with the poles. Just okay. Behave the way I want them to. Right. And then just. That feels comfy. Yeah, and just roll the knees out a little and pick the poles up and start to slide.